questions. This particular week, I don't know what has come over me. Um, really, it's just I sit, honestly, I kind of sit when I'm preparing a lesson plan and I'm either you know, reflecting on, is there something synchronistic that keeps showing up? Or I just sit quietly and I ask for guidance on what to teach. And at the beginning of the week, when I was asking for guidance about what to teach, um, I wanted to do lightning bolt poses. And so I realized if we have lightning bolt poses, it must tie in with some sort of Indian myth that I was unaware of. And sure enough, it tied in with Indra, who was the god of the skies, very similar to Zeus, who had a uh, lightning bolt as his weapon. And so our practice was being introduced to Indra and doing those poses. And then the next day I was uh, inspired by Costa Rica, thinking about sugar cane, and I wanted to build us up for sugar cane pose. And I had the same thought process. Well, if there's a sugar cane pose, I've never read about sugar cane in a myth. I need to look up how does this tie in with the stories that go around India. And then I discovered that the bows, the bow of Shiva, the bow of Kama, who was an avatar of Shiva, the god of love, as well as Ganesha and Malita had a bow uh, created of sugar cane. So I brought in that story. And then the next day, I, you know, this person, Lolita, had just come up with sugar cane. And this is somebody I've heard about for years, especially in the Kirtan community, uh, where we get together and uh, chant and um, sing together. Um, I've always heard Lolita mentioned, and I have tried to look her up before, found nothing, you guys. I mean, nothing. Um, but I knew that she also tied in with tantric yoga somehow. And so I was determined that yesterday I was going to figure out who Lolita was. And I shared it in that practice that she actually has a second name. And once I discovered the second name, then I finally was able to pull her up and learn a little bit more about her. And so when I was coming up for the lesson plan for today, I thought, well, you know, the other person that had the bow was Ganesha, so we might as well cover him. And Ganesha is the elephant-headed deity, so I wanted to remind you of a story of how he was created. It kind of reminds me of Wonder Woman's story a little bit. Uh, Parvati was Ganesha's mother, and Parvati was the wife of Shiva. Now, Shiva was kind of an Rastafari. You know, he would go out into the woods, and he would go out with his group of friends and stayed gone for hours and days at a time. He was a meditator and he would disappear in the mountain and meditate for days and months at length. And so his wife would get lonely. And Parvati had decided she wanted to have a child. She was tired of the loneliness, tired of Shiva always being gone. And she decided to mold a child out of clay and being the goddess that she was, brought this child to life. And she claimed it was Shiva's son, even though she created him. And the boy had grown up. He was becoming a man. Shiva had been gone the whole time. So Shiva didn't know about Ganesha. And at this particular day, uh, she was going to take a bath. And Ganesha was guarding the door to protect his mother from being in that vulnerable state. And Shiva came home with all of his friends and he's trying to go through the door and Ganesha stops him because he didn't recognize Shiva. And Shiva gets angry because it's his house and he wants to see his wife and he just cuts off his head. And then Parvati heard the racket comes running up and is hysterical because that was her child. And she's like, Shiva, what did you do? This was our child. And Shiva said, I didn't know. So he ordered all of his men to run into the forest. And he said, take the first head that you find and bring it back immediately. So the men go out, they find an elephant. They cut the elephant's head off. They bring it back. And being the god that Shiva was, he was able to bring his boy back to life. But he had an elephant head. 
So the symbology of the elephant is the big head represents think big, think outside the box, expand your mind. The big ears represent listen with the intent to really hear, listen closely, listen more. The small mouth represents maybe speaking less so that you can hear more. The small beady eyes were about focus and concentration. The elephant's trunk was about adaptability and learning how to be adaptable because change is constant. So elephants normally have two tusks and with Ganesha, one is missing. So the one tusk means hanging on to what is good and the tusk that is missing means let go of what doesn't serve you or let go of the bad things that have happened. And then the belly that he has is about processing the experiences that come to us in life. He has his hand in this muldra of Haya, which is about no fear and giving blessings. In another hand, he holds Prasad, which is um, supposed to be like sweets. And it's meant to be the sweet, sweet reward from the good acts that you send out to others. And then there's an ax he's holding with one hand, which is to cut away desires. Overall, he is said to be the God um, or the expression of the one God uh, that helps to remove obstacles in our path. So with all this in mind, we are gonna be doing some elephant poses today. We're gonna to do three different elephant, elephant poses and I will meet you on the mat. Make sure you have a block and hands reach Start lying down on your back with your knees bent and rest your hands on your belly. So go ahead and bend your knees, resting on your back. Hands resting on the stomach, shoulders Stealing away from the ears. Close your eyes. Once you close your eyes, I want you to get totally immersed in your breath. Set your drishti in and up to your mind's eye. So that your drishti is helping you to focus. Let your breath help to carry away any restless thoughts. The mind is often fluctuating with rivers of thoughts. We can slow this current down by controlling the breath. Now, continue to allow yourself to breathe slowly and deeply and keep your belly soft and plush. Imagine every time you breathe in to fill up your lungs and as that belly expands and balloons out, it's like the belly of Ganesha. Helping us to process the experiences we have in life. Let's go ahead and walk the feet a little closer together. So the heels are stacked underneath the knees. Rest your hands now beside your hips. We're gonna do a bridge flow to start with. So as you inhale, ground your feet, ignite your hamstrings and glutes and lift up in the air. 
And on your exhalation, circle the arms back around and land the hands with the sacrum. And then start to coordinate your movement with your breath. The inhale, opening the front of the body and strengthening the back of the body. Exhale, taking you down one vertebra at a time. And just find a pace that works for you. Being sure that you root down to the mouth of the big toes so that the knees stay more stable, less wobbly. And now find your block. And the next time you inhale, come to bridge, you're going to slide it right up underneath your low back. And just take rest for a moment in supported bridge. Imagine you have that Ganesha belly. Expanding it on the inhale. Allowing it to deflate on the exhale. And this kind of deep diaphragmatic or belly breathing is really good for digestion. Now we'll move into more of a full bridge just on one side. So we're going to release the psoas muscle before we do that. Pick up your left foot and then stiff arm your left knee. And then create your own resistance. So continue to try to pull the knee in, but at the same time, you're blocking it with your left hand. You will get a lot of trembly sensation in that left hip, creating your resistance. But this tension and release will help to flush out the hip and detox the muscles that we're currently contracting. Now let's release the left leg, straighten it out, rest on your heel, and just let that iliopsoas muscle open up. It's a muscle that often is pent up due to emotion or trauma. Now walk the left foot back. Inhale, pick up the right foot, stiff arm that knee. Create your own internal resistance, the two pushing together. Continue to create that tension, so you feel that vibration. And then let's exhale, release that side, extend the right leg, rest on the heel. Soften through that area surrounding your hip. Slowly breathing in and out through the nose. Now slide your right foot back and please remember this pose as well as waterfall pose. Let's go ahead and go into waterfall. Float the feet up in the air. These poses are really good for opening up the breath. So we had both uh, children over the weekend. We still have day, but Ella came home with a bad head cold. And what made it worse, the school that she goes to, they go to a farm 
almost every Friday and she's allergic to hay. So we couldn't figure out if it was a head cold, if it was allergies, and she was a mess. So I was showing her these poses before she went to bed because it can help to open up your breath because it's so hard to go to sleep if you can't breathe. And I want you guys to remember this as well since I've talked to a lot of people who have head colds this week. So it's something going around. Now I know their legs may be getting fatigued. So let's go ahead and place the feet back to the ground. And we're gonna lift one singular leg and that's gonna be the left. And when you float the left leg back up, you're gonna really point the toes, stretching the top of the foot, ankle, and shin. So this is one of our elephant poses. You can actually do this from wheel, but we're definitely not warmed up for that. And then we're gonna open up this left hip. So on your exhalation, circle that left leg down and around and inhale, bring it right back to the top. Exhale again, circle down and around, swoop it towards your mat and then back up towards the sky. One more, taking it off to the left, swooping down towards your mat, inhale to the top. Exhale, release. And then inhale, let's take the right leg up, just that one singular side. Point the toes this time. And so the leg here is acting like the elephant trunk what represents being adaptable. Let's circle the right leg off to the side, swoop it down towards the mat, inhale to the top. And twice more, exhale, circle it down and around. Inhale back up. And last one. And release. Good, now tuck and lift, move that block away. Roll it down one vertebra at a time. And then clasp a hold of your left knee and slide your right leg before you. So you're just holding this one knee. We are doing more of the yin flow style, active and passive. So here we're gonna inhale, extend the arms overhead. We're gonna extend the left leg out. And then as we exhale, we hug the left knee back in. We're gonna stay on this side. Inhale, extend the arms, the left leg. Exhale, draw it back into south. Twice more. And then just casually hold your left knee. Close the eyes, soften your jaw. your next exhale squeeze and pump that knee in slightly more before letting it go and then take a hold of your right knee slide your left leg out maybe even noticing the difference And then we'll flow. Inhale, arms overhead, right leg extends out. Exhale, hug the knee in. Continue. Execute the movement in a mindful manner. And on this next one, 
We will hold that knee. Maybe even considering or reflecting on anything that you may be experiencing that's creating an obstacle in your life. Lots of times it's our own self holding us back. Now draw both knees in to Apanasana. Affirming, I reduce my scattered forces to rise up and away into the sky. Now roll to one side of your body and we're gonna come all the way up to stand. When we come up to stand at the top of the mat, we're going to do a half uh, Surya Namaskar just to warm up the hamstrings before we go into the next elephant pose. So stand with the tension, nice posture, hands to heart, look forward, and then inhale, circle the arms up to bring the face. Exhale, dive in, Uttanasana, keeping your legs structured. Inhale, halfway up. Exhale, pour down. Inhaling up to stand. Exhale, dive back in, Uttanasana. Inhale, halfway up. Exhale, release. Inhale, back to the top. And this time when we come down, we're going to be more yin. Meaning, we're going to put a generous bend in the knees. We're going to get looser with the upper body. And we're going to hold the position longer. Targeting more of the connective tissues. And scan through your body. Notice where you're still holding, contracting, resisting, and see if you can surrender more. Even though we're trying to abide in stillness, it's really kind of impossible to do so, especially with this long held position, because energy is vibration. And that vibration is erupting, which can cause a little shaking, a little trembling, a little movement. Now let's start to heel toe the feet apart. Root down through the feet, line up through your legs, hands wrap to your waist, and slowly come up. So we're gonna create the mudra. We use this mudra a lot, the temple mudra or Jupiter mudra. But we don't do this elephant pose a lot. So the first thing we're gonna do is lift the arms straight up and then as we exhale, we're going to take ourselves down and arms shoot through the legs. We're going to come up again to the top. Exhale, take the trunk through the legs. Again, inhale up. Exhale, carry it through. And then this time you're going to come halfway up and look up underneath that left arm. So a little bit of a twist through the shoulders and upper body. And then exhale back down and through the legs. Inhale halfway up, twist up underneath the right arm. Exhale, release. And then now move side to side. Now 
And then gently release. Heel, toe, the feet back towards one another. We're going to step back with the left leg. We're going to bring that right foot over to the edge of the mat, so just kind of shift it over to the side. Hands return underneath the shoulders. And bring that block in because you might need it. We're going to stay here. And I don't know if you can see, but I'm keeping my back knee off the floor. If you absolutely have to drop it, do it. But try to stay with me if you can, because we will get there. If you need to stack on fist, you can be there. But this block is very useful because you can go halfway to the floor if you'd like. And then if you're more flexible, of course, you may not even need a block. You can send your forearms to the sticky mat. So we're not trying to be too active in the back leg. In fact, we're now gonna go at a sloth or snail pace. And slowly, 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 start to descend the left knee. Remember, a sloth or snail-like pace. Until eventually that left knee does spill down. And then you're going to want to untuck the toes after that. Woo, because that's a lot. Now, as you melt the head down and your hips down, I want you to notice your pelvic floor. And that deep stretch that we're receiving here. It is said that Ganesha is the guardian of the pelvic floor or the root chakra. I know this can get a little intense. We're just going to hold it. A few more breaths. All right, now let's step back onto the hands, removing the block away. Start to push back away from your hands through your hips. Bring the right knee back to join your left and just surrender into child's pose. Now, if you keep your arms extended, just let the arms be more relaxed. So that earlier pose was pretty intense. This can be your sweet reward following that work. What the prasad represents, Ganesha's hand. With your next in-breath, lengthen out through your arms, lifting through the elbows. Rock up hands and knees, exhale, downward facing dog. Pressing down through the palms, stretching back through the arms, opening up the vertebrae. Ensuring that you're also utilizing your legs. Now we're going to take that deep pose to the second side, which means we need the left foot to come through to the top of the mat. Once it comes through, heel toe the foot over. <coughs> Hand to the inside. Palms or fist. <clears throat> to 
see if you can bring the block in. Maybe you want to take it halfway to the floor or potentially all the way to the floor. When you're ready, snail, sloth like pace, casually, dipping, lowering, the right knee, down, down, down. When it touches down, uncurl the back toes. but stay in the pose. All right, we're slowly gonna exit out of this. Remember, we wanna stay cautious coming out just like we were cautious getting in. So stack back onto your hands. Heel toe that left foot towards the center of your mat to cross that left hand to the other side. Curl the back toes, we're stepping back into downward facing dog. From Adamukha Svanasana, just let your head release between the arms. Remember the beady eyes of Ganesha are about focus. So after you focus on creating your form, turn your focus to your drishti point. And then from finding your drishti point, focus on your breath. Eventually coming down to your knees. And then eventually coming down to the floor for Dandasana staff. So I'm going to turn this way. We're going to start with the right side. The right knee is going to bend. <coughs> I need to turn this heater off. It's making me cough. All right. The right hand is going to hold the outer edge of the right foot. We're going to lift it, and then we're going to pull it back. Now, keep the right elbow up so the knee has somewhere to go. And then elevate the crown of the head. Take your left arm forward. Now this is going to prepare us for an arm balance. You can take the left hand now to take the foot or you can wrap it inside the elbow. Your right forearm can cross over in front of your shin or potentially hook around the knee. And it may be that one hand is to the knee, one hand is to the foot. Either way is fine but we're lifting on the inhale and we're squeezing the leg towards our heart center on the exhale. Inhale, lift, exhale, squeeze. Now, find that block. Set the block, extend your right leg, and set your block on the outer portion of that ankle. 
Prop onto your hands and we're gonna strengthen the hip and the quads and the core by lifting the right leg up, sending the foot to the other side of the block. Inhale, lift the leg, bring it back to the inside of the block. We're gonna do that three times. Lifting, crossing over and release. Lifting, crossing over and release. One more. So this action that we're doing is required for that arm balance. Now, bring that block over to the outer part of the left ankle, slide your foot in, attach your hand to it, lift it up, pull it back. This is pulling the bow pose. Lots of bow poses in yoga. It only took me 20 years to discover that the bows were made of sugar cane. It took some research to discover that. Now take your foot in your right hand or the crook of the arm. Find what works for your body on this side and lift up on the inhale and squeeze it towards you on the exhale. And then release. All right, we'll prop onto the hands. We'll lift the left leg up, scale over the block, and set it back to the floor. Lift it up, bring it back towards the right leg, set it down two more times. This is a great way to just build up body awareness and strength so that when we get to the arm balance, you already know the mechanic required. All right, we're done with the block. Now we're gonna go for elephant trunk pose. Bend your right knee. Lift that foot up with your left hand and you hunker down and use the right arm to drive the right thigh back. Then as you let go of the foot, your leg has to squeeze the arm. So you're kind of pointing the foot and driving that calf down to your arm. When you set both hands to the floor, you have to lean forward with your head and heart, plug the palms down to lift your buttocks, and then we do that same action we just did over the block to lift the left leg. And I can't hold it very long, so I don't expect you to. And then when you come out, just kind of rock your knees up and down. And we'll try it on the other side. Don't give up. Slide your left foot closer. Pick it up. Catch it with your right hand. Dip down so that your arm can push back the left thigh. Let go of the foot, point the toes, and squeeze the leg to the arm. Hands down, use the bones of your arms to lift. Contract your belly, now contract your hip and quads. And lift the chunk. And then you can plop back down and shake out your knees. All right, from here, the right foot will join the left inner knee, half butterfly. That was our big daddy pose, by the way. So now you're just coasting. Exhale, let's fold over the leg. And then as you fold over the leg, remember the legs are considered part of that first chakra, just like the pelvic floor. So close your eyes and consider what is your current obstacle? I'll share what mine is right now. I feel like I'm all over the place. You know, I'm doing the online classes. I'm uh, teaching at Unity out here in Mount Juliet. I've been doing a workshop still at the hot room. I'm 
going to be at New Moon back in Franklin when it opens. I'm trying to do the Moonbeam meditations. I'm trying to do a YouTube channel. I'm trying to figure out Insta TV on Instagram. And I feel like I'm just all over the place. And Rob finally sat me down the other day and he said, what is your goal? What do you want to do? Where do you see yourself? Because I told him, I'm like, without the studio, I kind of feel like a fish out of water and I'm just trying all these different things. But he kind of honed me in and was like, you need to set a goal and then work specifically towards that. So my obstacle has just been scatteredness. So consider what is your current obstacle? And once you know what it is, then you can do something about it. Inhale, we'll slowly maneuver out. And I'm going to give you complete silence for that second side. So we'll lift the right knee, straighten it out. Bend your left knee, open the hip, half butterfly here. Opening the spine by lifting the arms. And then exhale, you can round down. So before we come out of the pose, I mentioned one thing holding me back is just not being crystal clear. But a lot of people during this time are being held back because they're so induced by fear. And that may or may not be your obstacle. In this quiet moment, sometimes we need to just ask for help, maybe on just discovering what it is or what we need to do about it, or just asking for help in general. Inhale, let's slowly start to build up. 
All right, we're gonna come down and do a twist. Now, listen to my instruction if you can't, because we're gonna do the twist differently today. So when you come down to your back, keep your feet uh, kind of resting on the floor, like the way we started. And you're gonna take your left leg and cross it over your right. And normally, right, we go that direction where that cross leg is going, but instead we're gonna go the other way. So expand your arms and then start to roll towards the inside of the right foot. So the knees are actually lowering to the left side and they probably are not gonna to touch the floor. It's okay if they hover above the floor, but if it strains your back muscles at all, you can use that block and bring it over and stack it underneath your left thigh. Otherwise, it can just hang out. I don't remember the scientific name for this certain muscle in the back, but they call it Q1. This helps to open that muscle that can cause some people grief. Now inhale, lift the knees back up, uncross the legs, and now let the knees roll to your left so that they're simply stacked. Just loud and breathe. Inhale, bring the legs up, feet down to the floor. And then we'll do that sequence to the other side. Right leg crosses over the left. But we're gonna roll to the inside of the left foot so the knees actually turn back to the right. And if this causes any issues, any strain, that block can go up underneath for support. So I didn't need support on the first side, the second side I feel like I do. And that may be a similar experience that you're having. If you are using support, you can move it out of the way because now we're lifting the knees up. Uncross the legs and let the knees both roll to the right. We're going to end our practice today with Ananda Balasana, that happy baby pose. So when you roll back to center, find your shins or feet. Just 
Lay the knees wide apart. Three more breaths. And release. It is our time for Shavasana. So, you know, you can line up in corpse pose. You can do instant Maui. You can bring a bolster, a blanket in. Whatever you need to do to get set up really comfortable. Take time getting yourself set up just right. And close your eyes. Maybe just witness the ebb and the flow of your breath. Noticing by now at the end of the practice, there's hardly an obstacle with your inhale or exhale. Notice how clear and open the breath has become. If the breath is really free and open, notice if that is having an equal effect of openness and freedom in your mind, in your body, and your spirit. And then if you want to continue to bear witness to your breath, you could use this as your technique today. Or you can use this time maybe to reflect and to get clear to ask for any removal of obstacles. Maybe you just want to invite in some peace. Breathing peace in to receive. And then offering peace back out as you exhale. Peace in, peace out.
hearing the bell chime, take that as your cue to maybe point and flex the feet or to bring a little movement into your fingers. Perhaps deepening the breath. Eventually hugging the knees in. Turn to one side of the body, come up to take a seat. Then joining your hands to prayer. May we be and stay inspired by these myths, these stories that remind us to ask for help, for these stories that hold symbolism and metaphors for us to learn from. And the reminders that there is so much more to life than we realize. May any of our obstacles be removed so that we can continue to grow and thrive and evolve. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Namaste.